What up? Before we get into the Pat Mayo experience slash take cast crossover, I want to let you know to rate, review, and subscribe to the Pat Mayo Experience on Apple Podcasts. Three lucky people who do this, if they include their Twitter handle or email address, will be gifted $100. Who doesn't want $100 for 30 seconds of work? It would really help out the show as we push towards the new year. And coming up on this one, it's a fun one with Davis. I mean, if you enjoy Davis and I talking about random stuff, you'll enjoy this episode. If you don't, you're going to fucking hate this episode. So either way, thanks for downloading and starting the show. I mean, that's all that really matters in terms of analytics. But I hope you do enjoy it. Uh, I will be back on Friday with Cam and Rob to do the best bets for the NFL. And then I'll have my injury breakdown on Saturday. So just wanted to give you some more filler content if you're looking to fill some time on thanksgiving get away from the fam or you got a long drive we have geez i mean even with the spread pick show and the rankings debate show there's still probably another three and a half hours of pat mayo experience content you can already go and check out if not have a safe holiday uh hope everyone's doing well out there and this is a phone we talk about bond we talk about golf memberships uh communism like we always do and how i'm not you know the biggest proponent of it uh, but, you know, it's Davis and I, so we'll go back and forth on some of this stuff. Uh, enjoy the show, be safe, and let's get to it. All right, everyone, welcoming in Pat Mayo uh, to, to another CoronaCast. We're, we're approaching, what, two, two years of... Uh, of these shows where uh, we we kind of just shoot the shit goes on the take cast feed goes on the uh, the PME feed and we we don't have an agenda and we kind of just uh, you know it's it's a, it's a good brain dump Pat it's it's a good brain dump for all the things that we don't get to talk about on other shows this really feels I, I've been listening to the past few take casts like when you talk too much about crypto I don't really care but when you have like other like you had Holka on you had Pat on uh, and you had Pete on a few weeks before that like I love those chats. I feel like outside of your Patrick Laird show, which I know did awesome, I, those have to be like the highest rated ones that you do, right? Yeah, the the ones the ones that people like the most are are basically when uh, when it's me and and one of my buddies. And I mean, I I of course I love I love doing those shows. But sometimes the shows that I get really excited about doing, uh, you know, people uh, the 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 downloads are not there, like. Uh, the the ones that people really don't like uh, are the ones when I have uh, like a European guy on to talk about soccer. Uh, so, I, you know, I've had, you know, guys who whose books I've read and whose podcasts I listen to on the show every week, you know, Jonathan Wilson and, and some of those guys. And the, the people are, are not into the uh, the soccer so much. But, yeah, people do love they just love the shows where it's, and Pat and I talked about this last week. People, the reason why the thing that people love about podcasts is it's just like hanging out with your buddies. Like that is what people really appreciate the most about podcasts, I think. Oh, I completely agree. That's the entire strategy of my podcast and it always has been is try to find the people that you have the best rapport with. Because I, I get people all the time that always ask me, it's like, yo, you, you should have me on. Like I won $25,000 on DraftKings. You should get me on to have picks. I was like, I don't think that people really care about the picks when they listen to this podcast, to tell you the truth. They, the most, as evidenced by my most popular show with me, a moron, and Jeff all yelling at each other, people seem to like that. Yeah, they they love they love that show. You know, they love they love the cuss show because they love the the interplay. I mean, uh, you know, because they're you and I are obviously both like super bullish on on podcasts and their place in in popular culture and stuff. And the thing that they offer that television doesn't offer that reading doesn't offer is is it it just feels like you are in uh, the the middle of a conversation. Which is not to say that you know there's not a place for very heavily produced podcasts that are more you know narrative driven and stuff. But but the shows that I like the most are you know, just, just much more like that. It's just, just some, some dudes hanging out. And it's an easier lift for you on this show when you can just be like, well, you can text. I remember you texted me one time. I was like, yeah, I don't have a guest. It's like, yeah, let's just hop on for an hour and talk about whatever. I'm sure that show did fine. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it is. I mean, I, I, uh, the thing is like, uh, hustling for guests who are not in, uh, the immediate circle of, of either, you know, crypto bros or, or DFS bros. It's just a little bit harder to line your schedule up. Um, you know, some of the, the people that we've had on the, that I've had on the show are, uh, you know, they, they, they're very far away. They're very far away from this world. And it's just a little bit, it's just a little bit more of a, of a hustle to, uh, to get those people. 
That's what I found about my Thursday DraftKings pick show, which now, weirdly, still does great audio-wise, not great on YouTube for whatever reason. And that's probably the show that has, like, the biggest guests. Like, I mean, you and, like, Levitan, and I'll get Dink and Leone, and, like, I'll get real people who know things and be like, no, uh, that, that's not good enough for me. I, I need to have someone that you can yell at the entire time. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you know, for, for the DFS show, uh, people, you know, they really want the picks, but it's, it's kind of easier to get the picks from like a written article. Um, so, you know, I, I, I can see, I can see why that would be true. Um, you know, and then, and then it also would make sense why the pick the, the DFS show would do better from an audio perspective than a video one, because you're, you're not gaining anything out of, uh, you know, seeing the, the hosts interact with one another. And it's just all about like, I, I need to know, you know, am I playing Kenny Galladay or Kadarius Tony and, and give me the answer key. Hey, I have graphics on my show. The, they're great graphics. They're great. They're awesome. Yeah, I, maybe I thought I that, would. I thought that would be like a thing for people to tune in. Although my new studio was almost done, which I'm very fired up about. I mean, that's got to be that's got to be fantastic, right? It's been a while, and the customization, the lighting grid. There's a lot that goes into building a studio that even that I had overlooked, like building like a real. Type a studio. real studio well people have told me it looks like the starship enterprise bridge which i don't know whether i should take as like slander or a compliment but I-, I felt like for ages the video version of my show really stood out from everyone else's video because of the production quality mm-hmm. and it feels like that gap is really closed over the past three years or so i was like i if i'm gonna continue to like give out very mediocre picks i at least need my video production quality to be like way better than everyone else be better so i I feel like this solves that problem for me but now we like just even like getting the lighting grid right everything weird like that although the cool part about the set is that it's actually three sets in one so it's a gigantic set but I can shoot it at different angles to make it look like three different sets. So I can give make it look different. Yeah. I, I can have like the, the Pat Mayo experience show can be, you know, it's own set, like the, the really big set, but like Paul and Cody do their show. Uh, we can give them like a different angle that looks like their own set. So it looks like we can have multiple shows with the, it, that will make it look like their own set. I mean, that's something that I've wanted for a while. It's, it's all a part of phase three of Mayo media network, but we've been trying to up a level, up a level, up a level. And I hope that this is something that can really create a gap for us especially in like selling the content off to like third party like these digital media players where there's a lot of money in that yeah and instead of having guy shooting from a bad angle on his iphone like in his basement it's like oh this looks like it's in an espn studio yeah that's like uh that's like a lot of what um you know daily roto's parent company is doing is a lot of like selling off you know short short videos and stuff and so uh, getting, getting a good background and getting good lighting is like, uh, which I'm, I have been so lazy, um, getting my like office area set up in this house, uh, buying a house who knew you, you actually got to do a lot of crap. Like I thought, I thought I would have like this awesome, amazing, uh, organized office space with like all my, all my stuff hanging up and, and, uh, you know, it hasn't exactly gone that way. Well, the studio that I've been shooting out of for the past, past six months is just a bedroom in my basement that I converted because I didn't have, when I moved, I obviously didn't right. have a studio ready, but I, I was able to set this up between Paul and I in like two days. I, I think it's worked out well. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it took me, uh, so I, I transitioned from the, the screen printed background, which what, what is your background, like physical items, or do you have, do you have like a screen behind you right now? It's all physical items. It's, and I, well, I, the, the reason to have physical items versus having the green screen is you can create depth in the shot. And that's really difficult to achieve in a really small room. So you need to position a lot of the items like more up in the frame versus stuff that's back in the frame, light both things a little bit differently, have a key light on yourself, and then you stand out from the background. But the stuff in between you and the very back also stand out. So it just, it makes the shot look a little bit better uh, if you can light it all properly. So I feel like I've achieved that in this room, but it sucked not having in-studio guests. Like that's a, that was such a big right. element to my show. And, and frankly, Jeff and I have gotten like at first it was kind of a disaster because Jeff like wasn't paying attention the entire time. Like there's always something lost in translation unless like you and I are really good 
via the internet because we've only ever talked via the internet. It's like Celia, the internet. Celia and I have been doing the ranking show for eight straight years. We've never done it in person. So we, we have a flow. We have a cadence. We know how that works. Because you don't want to get into the situation where it's, hi, I'm Pat. Let me ask you a question. Davis, you talk for three minutes. Okay, I will respond for 30 seconds. I will say another question. Then you respond for three minutes. Like that becomes so monotonous after a while that like it goes back to what you said. If you're going to do a podcast, whether it's audio, whether it's video, it needs to have some sort of conversational flow, and that can be really difficult to achieve with people that you're unfamiliar with. So that's why I was thinking about next year for the DraftKings show is kind of say, fuck it, and just have the same person on every single week. Although that might not be the best in terms of overall like high-end picks, I think the show itself would actually be a lot better because you would develop that rapport with someone. Uh, and then the show itself would just be elevated in that way in terms of actual quality of entertainment quality of like, your listening experience versus like quality of picks. People can get picks anywhere. They should go subscribe to run the Sims.com daily No matter where it is like ETR, like people are having good picks years. Like these optimizers, work. people are having good picks, right? Yeah. yeah, no. And, and what, what that would allow you to do, uh, if, if you had, you know, just, just one person on is it allows like some narrative and some continuity for, for the seasons. So you could kind of, you know, give each other shit about bad picks from the week before, follow up on on good picks like oh you know you had you know x y or z as like a stud wide receiver he smashed this week because as it as it exists now uh you know they're like you know we just did our our thanksgiving pick show and then you know i probably will only be on one or two more times on on your pick show for the rest of the year and we'll completely have forgotten uh whatever happened on thanksgiving unless unless it you know it was spectacular uh in one direction or the other but that i think that continuity would help it as a platform for sure i think so too and i think that's why people come to my show oh by the way if you've never come to my show or don't even care about my show uh, i am giving away what did i say a hundred dollars to three people three people to three to three separate people all you need to do if you're listening to this on the take cast right now or just listen to it on the pat mayo experience go rate the pat mayo experience five stars on apple podcast leave some sort of review you can make it up for all i fucking care and leave your twitter handle or email address so i can contact you if you're a winner i'll do a draw sometime next week and Three of you will win a hundred bucks. Who doesn't want a hundred bucks? Who doesn't? I mean, look, I would take a hundred bucks. Maybe I'll go leave her. I think I've already left a review. I think I'm precluded. I mean, you can just go. And if anyone's left a review before, you can just leave a new review or update your review. So it bumps it to the top of the list and I'll, I'll see it. Uh, I've left a review on your show. Hey, everyone should always leave reviews on people's shows. People don't understand. It's, it's They're so kind and it just costs you nothing. And it, it's really everything to us, weirdly enough. Yeah, I uh, I don't remember when it was, maybe a year or two ago. I went through every podcast in my feed, all the stuff that I was subscribed to, and I left uh, a five star rating and a review for every show that I listened to because I was like, look, I I do a podcast, I do multiple podcasts. Uh, I I would if someone every, every time someone leaves uh, a review for me, I appreciate it. So I, I just went and did it for, for every show that I listen to. And it's really important to me right now, the reason that I'm giving away the money is that I we were talking about this a little bit on my show on the Thanksgiving one, but like it's ad sales time for me. So rating and yeah. reviews lead to more downloads, lead to higher spots on like the iTunes charts or the Apple charts as they're called now, the Spotify charts, whatever it might be. And then I can just charge more per ad and where this is my livelihood, I would like to be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, so, so leave, leave Pat some sales. So the ads are good. And, uh, so that he can continue to have a nice and beautiful studio to, um, you know, to, to, to make the, the YouTube show look visually perfect. Uh, and well, I'm actually in a weird conundrum right now because like the desk is built everything like the construction is done. Like the painting needs to be done on the floor. Like it needs like a matte paint on the ceiling. So it doesn't reflect the light. Same as on the floor, like weird stuff that I never just would never have considered. And then we have to like soundproof yeah. the room, but I might be switching from like the mic that I'm using right now to lav mics. And that's what we started with on the Pat Mayo experience. And the sound quality just wasn't very good for it. Maybe I need better mics. Maybe the room wasn't soundproof properly enough. But that might be an, an odd switch for me, going back to lav mics after really most of my shows all the time have been with like with, with the hard mic that I'm talking into right now. Like, you're on the lav mic right now, and I, I guarantee you I sound better than you do. 
Oh, you, you definitely do. Um, but my, so the, the mic that I had was your, I mean, you probably remember it. I had the, I had the huge like yeah. monstrosity that, that blocked your uh, face. hanging. Yeah. Like it was, it was mass. I mean, it was a really good mic. Um, but just the, you know, the way, the way that it worked out, like it, it, uh, this, this visually looks better, but you are right. Your, your sound quality is way better than mine for yeah. sure. So I, I think it might just be buying a more expensive lav mic might be the move, a higher quality one, like a wireless one, because yeah, the, the look, there's a reason that they use lav mics on TV in studio shows, because it's just a much cleaner look. Although anytime that you have a radio show that's broadcast for TV, whether it be like Dan Patrick or Colin Coward, that they're using it's like, always, it's always the, the real mic. Yeah. And I, don't even know how much that stuff matters anymore to tell you the truth like if i was going to do some of these like short clips to sell them off um for like these short digital players i'd probably use a lav mic in those like when i used to when i do my pga tour videos when i was at my old studio or do anything off the prompter i would always use lav mics too because that's video only it's just a much cleaner look but like even like the joe like look at joe rogan's podcast like there is zero production quality in that and it, it doesn't matter yeah, because uh, again, people just like it, it. The that stuff matters on the fringes, and it matters for some of the things you do. But at at like a true macro level, all that all that matters uh, is. I mean, you know, Joe Rogan gets amazing guests, and I've never listened to that show, but people r enjoy it. You know, they they like the way that Joe Rogan interacts with his guests. So uh, I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing he, he is able to, does a good job, you know, developing rapport or whatever with, with the guests. I, I tune in when it's a guest that I like. I, I it's that weird. Like, it, yeah. It's weird. The Joe Rogan <laughs> occupies this really weird space, like in the culture now, especially like in internet culture, because like, if I ask my dad, like, Hey, did, have you ever listened to Joe Rogan show? It's like Joe Rogan's not on news radio anymore. Yeah, he's like, he's like, <laughs> well, he's a fear, the fear factor guy, right? That's that's what I think of him as. Yeah, I mean, like, because obviously he's on UFC every, well, not every single week, but most weeks. But like UFC is not as, it's popular, but it's like, what do you think is bigger, hockey or UFC? It's probably UFC, right? Um, No, I bet, I bet more people this year will watch a singular game of hockey then we'll watch a singular ufc fight yeah but if you get into like a what was the last the mcgregor khabib or whatever the last mcgregor one like the amount of pay-per-view sales for that are, fight are huge plus yeah. plus people who just illegally stream it or get together with 12 people and watch it probably have higher ratings right. in the u.s at least than the stanley cup finals uh yeah yeah for sure so, I, bet, I bet that's true. I don't know. I, I don't watch either of these things. So I, I'm like uniquely unqualified to, to speak on them. Yeah, I'm just very curious, like it just how because Joe Rogan is probably more popular now from the podcast than anything else. But he has all these feeder things where people know him from that, to put it in. Right. And, and he's such a divisive person, kind of. I feel like he's a very divisive person to people who have never listened to him. Yeah, because he, this is what every time, every time I'm like, you know, Joe Rogan is a meathead or whatever, what people say about him is that he has all these idiots on his show and then just like believes whatever they say. But like he, I, I believe to be fair, you know, he'll have uh, some, some lib on and then he'll have Ben Shapiro on and, and treat them both with equal, uh, you know, respect and, and open mindedness or whatever, which I guess uh you know people are are interested in i i don't know it just it just is it, it's it's definitely not for me no probably not i mean and all of them aren't for me either it just you see uh, it, it seems to really trigger the, the libs like you uh at least a lot of the joe rogan stuff it's probably just based on the guess he has on stuff that he says but i i feel like it's a bit more insightful than people who have never listened to it actually give it credit for I mean, I, I think that, you know, to be fair, the, the, the thing that he seems to do well is, you know, he at least attempts to like be open to new information and bring new sources of information on about it. Like he, I guess the, the guess he gets seems to indicate that he is at least intellectually curious. And I'm also, I, I also am, am totally with him on the, uh, you know, self-improvement, you should work out, you should not eat junk food um type stuff like uh, all of that all of that seems very good uh you know but like having ben shapiro on your show does not seem good seems seems bad instead maybe i'll start having ben maybe i'll have you and ben shapiro on my show you guys can debate Ugh.
to I see I, and yeah that which is which is like totally the worst thing I can ever imagine is like being being forced to like listen to Ben Shapiro talk be, sounds terrible be, being owned by Ben Shapiro on a podcast on Pat's podcast yeah uh literal like literal nightmare fuel would just would not would it would be zero percent interested so how are you you said, you said the house is a lot of work well, like I I just I I had the gutter people buy yesterday yep uh need new gutters three thousand bucks need new least. gutters it's like yeah. oh great <laughs> so i haven't had anything quite like that yet but it's gonna be getting pretty close because we knew when we bought this house that the um the furnace like the the heating system is like pretty old uh and it should be good to get us through this winter but it's definitely one of those things you have to start thinking about replacing and that, I mean, you just, you, the stuff just adds up so quickly, right? So like it, if you add that and like, oh, you know, what if something is wrong with the refrigerator? And it's just like, you know, all, all these, all these things that when you are a renter for, you know, a decade are, are literally just not your problem. Like something goes wrong, you call the landlord, they send their guy out and it's done. And then it just, it becomes, uh, uh, it, you know, it becomes your problem, which is not fun. You don't, you don't want to like home ownership is cool because of the way it allows you to, to store the value of your wealth and, and because you basically get free money for it because you get it at 3%. But uh, all three, the other stuff is not three, very fun. Three, 3% is what your mortgage is? Good God. It might even be lower than that, honestly. Uh, I can't uh, remember off the top of my head. I was going to say, like, I, I, just, I still own my condo in Toronto. We, we kept it to rent out. Yeah. So we, we, just, uh, we had bought it five years ago and we just renewed it uh, this month. It was our five-year anniversary of owning the place. So five years ago, I believe our mortgage was a five-year fixed at 2.29% and we just renewed for 1.81%. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely definitely higher than two. I, I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head. See, I figured, but you, I figured I mean, you know things like this, but you're, you're right though. Like it, the, the cost of borrowing this money at this point and it's just created, it's the reason that I was able to keep the place. And I mean, I bought my house here. We kept the place there. I bought another place to build the studio in because I didn't want to rent anymore. I feel, I felt like if I'm going to have to pay, I went and scouted around. It was going to be like between $2,500 and $3,500 a month to like rent a space big enough to build a studio, that kind of thing. And I don't even know if that would have been all in or if that was just the space. I was like, or I can just buy like a cheaper style just house. Buy it. With right. you know, like, if I had the money for the down payment, which I, I did through because I bought it through the company, and if there's a space big enough there, and then my mortgage is only going to be like eleven hundred bucks per month, which seems like a big win for me because I'm not just giving away thirty six k a year. <laughs> oh well, yeah. I mean, like that is that is the uh, uh, a life hack right now, which is that like if you're not borrowing money um, at these rates, you are like like rent like renting for large chunks of american history has been fine uh you know because uh inflation has been fairly normal wages have been fairly normal uh but like the last like four three four years has been a really bad time to be renting uh because you you could be borrowing money at like you know rates that are half of what inflation is the issue is if you're ever going to borrow money you need money to begin with and that's really become yeah. the issue that's i mean that's what i saw in toronto the most before i left was it, it wasn't like a one percent thing but it was people there was just the amount of people complaining that they can't afford anything in toronto which is pretty much the case because everything is so ridiculously so expensive. expensive but there's just so many people there that people there's enough people to afford the stuff and then other people can't figure yes. out how people can afford it. it's like well there's people with money. When you live in a city of 6 million people, there's people with money, shockingly enough. And a lot of it. That is, that is, ge that is generally how bell curves work. Yeah. Someone, someone has to be available to purchase the high end stuff. Otherwise it wouldn't be available for those prices. And if you bought before, like everything you know, tripled or doubled, then you actually have equity to borrow against. And then you can just you know, spread your wealth more by borrowing against your house, buying another house, renting it out for the cheap price that you come at. Even if you come at it with a bit of a loss, it's not that big of a deal because the money is so cheap that all the money you kept in investments is just going to make more money than the money you're borrowing anyway. So it's quite the cycle. I'm, I'm trying to get into the cycle. That's where I want to be at. Yeah, I mean, I, I am very clueless on that stuff. I mean, I can tell you how to like, uh, you know, borrow against your, your equities in like, you know, a bunch of complicated web three ways, but I have, 
I my my property ownership journey has has been very narrow thus far. Well, I think when it comes to at least from my experience, um, obviously I'm a singular person, so this isn't going to translate to everyone. But the stuff that I've chosen to invest in, uh, especially like over the past five years, the the first time I've ever really had money in my life, has been just stuff that I can figure out myself. It's the same reason like I'm not really into yeah. crypto. I don't really get it. I understand the upside. Like I, I feel like I understand it way more than like your average person, but compared to the people that I interact with on a daily basis, I know nothing about it. But when it comes to home ownership, like that logically makes a lot of sense to me about how I can leverage sure. this asset, how I can get rid of this asset if I need to. If I had to sell it at a loss, how much do I have left? Am I you know, retaining my equity by doing this? So I, I, property ownership for me is like how a lot of people are investing in crypto. So like the more I can get my hands on, probably the better. Although a lot of people would just really frown on that. Like that, you're, you're the worst. You're really a part of the housing crisis problem. But like, yeah, it's not changing. I'm not changing it. So I might as well get in on it. I mean, there are, there are, I mean, the, the systemic causes of like inequality in capitalist economies, like you're not, you're not doing anything, you know, you're, you're just, uh, because to, to expect anyone to be, uh, like an ethical actor, the way our economy works is, is, uh, unreasonable because if you are an ethical actor, that means that you are losing money and you're losing, you know, like survival odds. Like it's, it's, it, it would be the, the reverse of what humans and, and animals are conditioned to do. Well, that's so you're not doing anything wrong, but that's always the fundamental problem when people talk about like utopian society or socialist or even communist, uh, type systems that you, all of those systems are predicated on everyone being a good actor within the system. If not, you're well, gonna... no, what they're, what they're actually predicated on is they're actually predicated on the government taking that decision out of your hands and saying, you yeah, know, you, but, you but, get, you but, get what you get. But all that does is consolidate power amongst an even tinier group of people who control everything. And that power is, power is just going to corrupt everyone. That, that's all that has happened throughout human history. So at least in the capitalist society, at least more people have access to the top tier. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I think like theoretically that's true, but like, obviously no, I, I, like, I, I, would, I would say in practice, that's true. Theoretically, it's not true. Yeah. So, so, well, and especially with the, the practices we've had now, though, I don't think that's true in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, but, yeah, but, but, but again, but, but like they're all, is, but they're also not like they get, it's, and they it's, have like no people. Well, it's not even they that have they like have, no it's not even that they have no people, but it's the same. It's, it's a very American thing to paint anything that's not. American capitalism as communist or socialist. Like people say, right. Like, they'll paint Canada as a socialist country, which it is very much not. There are socialist elements it just, to it. I'm, I mean, it just, it just means you get to, uh, you know, you don't die of like, uh, you know, preventable illnesses. That's, that's really what socialism means these days. It, it's basically capitalism with a higher social safety net and higher taxes and everywhere else, which is like, and which is like close to the ideal functioning economy anyway. I don't know if there is an ideal functioning co economy to tell you the truth. No, I, 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 uh, every year I get older, I, I, I agree with that more and more that, um, that, you know, all, all of these systems, all of these systems, you know, clearly have their problems. And, and really the people who are the most full of shit are the ones who sell you on a utopian vision of anything. Yeah. And you also have to tailor the, both politics and economy of your country around its citizens as well and what they actually want, what the people of your country right. actually value and what Americans value versus what Canadians value versus what Swedes value versus what Danes value versus what Germans value is just completely different. Like it's not completely different, but there's a lot of gaps in between like being on the same common thread. Um, yeah. And it's, it's even more difficult in the larger that a country is, you know, like, uh, the United States, uh, notably massive, uh, both in land mass and in, uh, population density and the people in the South of the country and the people in the middle of the country and the people, uh, on the coast all have, uh, different values and, and beliefs. And, and so that, that create it, I, and which is, from us talking, that's also true in Canada as well. Like basically there's like a Canada version of the Midwest versus the coastal elites too. Yeah. I don't even know if it's like Midwest versus coastal elites versus the South, 
be I, I just find it's like urban versus rural areas are really the major yeah. differences like there's people that live in cities and that's one way of life that people get used to and obviously it changed it's not the same in new york as it is in denver or california or in la as it even is in san diego or san diego as it is in atlanta or dallas or austin but there's more commonalities between those people rather than people who live in towns of you know 1500 people 3000 people just the values are different in those sorts of ways which is like so that's like sociologically fascinating too like why why would you know why would why would big cities lean that way and small towns and it's you know it's it's about like uh the the access to education that people have and and you know their likelihood to going to universities and stuff no, like that i i actually disagree with that you don't I, think so? I, I don't know if it's an education thing i mean that's probably an element to it i think it's just an experiential thing where you just you have so many more diverse experiences in larger places Living with more people yeah. just because there's just so many different people from so many different places in these large cities where, I mean, I'm even seeing it now. Like I just moved back to the place where I'm from. I'm from a pretty like the city I live in is bigger than Pittsburgh, for example, uh, in terms of population, right. but it's not like a huge city. It has like 450,000 people. Um, and you know, you can kind of see a bit of a difference between people who have kind of lived here their entire lives or didn't go away to college or didn't move away for, I mean, I was gone for almost 15 years, uh, just based on sort of like their values and how they approach things. Like you, you learn things one way and then you never learn anything different. Why would you think that's wrong? I, I, I wonder too, if, do you think it's a religion thing too? Like religion way more prevalent the, in, in smaller cities because the church is like the, the churches are areas of community versus uh, you know, like, I mean, there are a, like a, in Toronto, how many clubs can you join? How many, y your gym, your, your, your hockey league, whatever. Like, I, I think religion probably has a part to play uh, there as well. Potentially. That also seems like, a, not to say that religion obviously exists in Canada. It's far less of a talking point in Canada for like in the U S like, than here. like religion comes up so much in like day-to-day -day conversation, it seems, and like really infiltrates the politics of the U S like it doesn't here like at all like i could not tell you any of the people that ran i know that jagmeet singh is a sikh that's i don't even really know what that means but i know that, well it's it's uh i, I know I mean, it's a, that was because yeah he so here in the states basically the the uh you know the republican party felt that they were having a tough time they were they were getting mopped up by uh in in the bill clinton years they were they were losing supreme court seats they were losing um you know they were they were just getting they were they were you know they were having a lot of trouble and they were like you know what can we do uh how can we how can we turn the tide and you know basically this this group of people realized okay we can we can turn the tide by making um abortion and gay marriage um you know political issues and tying that into religion and and they you know basically they like like for example catholics in the united states for basically the last 100 years have been strict uh democrat liberal voters and and by flipping that one simple switch the republicans were able to you know access the the largest religion lar largest organized religion in the united states and turn them into republican voters i, I guess my point would, but you have that on both sides though where like you like I remember like Obama talking about like his faith and like that, that's a, well, that's that, that, so that was their response of being like, well, how can we keep all these people from abandoning us? Basically. I, I guess so. But like, it's all games, but, but, but that's all ingrained. Like even Trump had to like pretend that he was religious. Like I, I, I <laughs> Trump, Trump, like that's a Trump part of it. Read, trying to, <laughs> Trump trying to read the Bible was that I, you know, uh, the, the, we, we always have, we'll have the memes at least. But that's ingrained in the politics on both sides. Like Joe Biden has to be like, yeah, I'm this, this, and this. I, I, you know, I haven't gone to church in this time, but now I need to go back and like appear like I go to church. Like, you know this stuff about the candidates. I feel like here we don't know that about our like, – I could not tell you any sort of religion, whether they're atheists, whether they don't go non-practicing, whether they're super religious. Wouldn't have a clue. Don't know. <laughs> Which is the way it should be. You should not know an elected official's religion. Like, that. that seems – like that just feels like it should be universally agreed upon that those things should not be related at all again that just seems like a very uniquely american thing but religion just seems to be a bigger thing in the u.s than it is here like yeah. on, the, on the whole yeah like, i i don't have a sense uh, is that true in europe too like are, aren't european people just like very 
past religion being in the public like life? I don't really know. I can't really speak to that. That I just don't know. I, I would guess yeah. my guess would be yes, depending on where you where you are. Like I would think in now well, it's probably big in Italy, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're probably super Catholic. Like, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I just have kind of heard that that Europe has become very secular. But I, I guess you know, not that I can speak from like firsthand experience or whatever. Yeah, I want to get back over there. I got sick last week for the first time. Sucks ass, doesn't it? I got, I got this cold like three, like a month ago now. So I was at a commission for like four days. I was still shooting shows. I could barely talk. I could like barely breathe as I was going through. Like I had, I had to do a solo show on Saturday and I had to take, take breaks after every seven minutes, to like blow my nose, like clear out the phlegm from my chest because I was just running out of air trying to get through everything. Flu season is back in a bad way and having two kids in daycare is not helping. No, uh, flu. Have, have you gotten your flu shot? No, we were scheduled to get it like this week. And then we all just got yeah, the flu. The worst. And then we all got, got the flu instead. <laughs> got the flu instead. Yeah. So I, I got, uh, I, did, I mean, maybe it was a, maybe it was a flu. Maybe it was a cold or whatever, but I got it like a month ago. And I mean, I, I swore I was going to die. Like, I mean, I, it was miserable. Like I, 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 like you, you know, had to do, had to do shows, had to do podcasts and stuff. And it was just like, I felt like my head was going to explode the entire time. Yeah, it's it's not something I and, you know, everyone wearing masks and everyone not going anywhere. Like, I, I felt great last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I mean, it was the first time I'd been sick in two years or whatever. But, which, uh, but it was, was... The, it was the first time in the history of me doing my show. So over the past nine years that I was so like I, I got sick once the first year that Paul and I started uh, working with DraftKings that I like, couldn't do a waiver wire show. And I was so devastated. Uh, cause I, I pride myself on never missing a show. And like, after this week, I was like, you know what? I think, uh, when the Super Bowl is over, I'm going to take like a two week vacation. I'm just going to do it. Screw it. Where are you going to go? I don't know. I was actually going to say, I'm going to probably go somewhere in Europe, South of Spain, maybe South of France. Yeah. I mean, you should go, you should get, you should, uh, get some sun. How's your, how's your golf game right now? Not great. Um, changed my swing this year. Like, uh, went and, uh, went and got lessons. I sponsored a golfer. Have you, uh, yeah. Have you, um, I was going to say, I was going to say like, how long has it been since you've gotten a lesson? Uh, I, I, well, like as of like right now, it's probably been yeah three months cause I haven't played golf in two months. Yeah. I, I, I had my worst round, I think since I like started like very seriously trying to like think about golf this, this weekend, I, I barely played. Um, and I, I had a membership, like I bought a six month membership to a, a driving range and it expired about two months ago. And so I, I basically have not hit, like, I, I was like embarrassed at how bad I played this last weekend. It was tough. Uh, the last time I've actually, the last time I got out on the course was probably just towards the end of October. And it was so cold that day. It was probably Celsius wise. It was like seven degrees, which isn't so bad. But it, there was like 35 mile per hour winds and like I was shivering on the 11th hole. Like I, I could barely grip my club anymore. So I like I was wearing gloves. That didn't help. I tried wearing a jacket. That didn't help. You know, once you're cold, you're cold. Like you really need to prevent cold from happening to you and then you won't get as cold. But if you let the cold in a little bit, you just remain cold. There's no getting warmer at that point. Right. It was one of those situations. So that was not a fun round. Uh, so we just called no, super, super cold golf. Not fun. Uh, you know, it, it, when, when, uh, when, uh, uh, you hit a bad iron shot and your hands are, are just stinging, just the worst, but I actually, uh, cussed myself and our other friend, Tim, oh, I actually got a membership for next year. The, the club that I've been trying like, we're on a wait list for the club. That's like right next to my house, which is like super nice. Uh, and it's the only one like in downtown in the city which makes it super convenient also makes it super difficult to get into the wait the wait list is now six years to get in because no one has given up their membership since covid started <laughs> yeah that it, it is insane how much the impact of covid has had on on golf like golf courses now like all the golf courses i go to here are like expanding uh you know uh redoing redoing x y or z putting in lakes redoing the clubhouse because it, it was the best they've done in business 
Probably, I, I honestly, probably ever. Like this is probably the best golf courses have ever done. I, I would think so. Like all the new people playing golf and all the older members don't want to give anything up. So we're on this wait list. So they actually, a course that I grew up was like the nicest course around. Like it was a designed course. It hosted the women's Canadian open. Like whenever the skins game would come to like this area, that's where they would host everything. And then it just became like awful over the past 10 years. They stopped like doing maintenance on it and everything like that. And then it, it sold earlier this year and they like they didn't completely renovate it but they just started taking care of it again and it became super nice again and then at the end of the year they're like yeah uh it was a private course then it became like a semi-public course and they went back to full right. private this year and they were like yeah we're basically waiving all initiation fees uh if you want to join right now it's like let's do it let's just get in here for at least an- let's just get in <laughs> until we yeah. get accepted at the other place let- let's get in here it's a bit farther away but it- it's gonna be i've never had a full like exclusive private membership membership before uh i'm kind of excited about it and like i actually golfed with a friend the last time i was out we that's the course that we played uh and he's a like scratch golfer was on the canadian national team from ontario and like he usually holds like two memberships up there because he needs like practice facilities at some places because he plays a ton Uh, he gets like a discount yeah well he gets a discount on it but because they want him playing out of their club so he can go represent them and he asked me how much the membership was at this place. He's like, oh, that is, I can have eight of these memberships for what it costs for one of my Toronto memberships. Like golf is ex- right. Ex- exactly. Golf is expensive here, but it's not expensive at the same time compared to anywhere else in the world. Co- yeah. Comparatively. So, right. so that's nice uh, that we, you know, we get practice facility. So I'm hoping next year I'm going to continue taking lessons over the winter at like a simulator, uh, with the guy that I sponsored this year for the Atlantic Canadian tour. He won Atlantic Canadian player of the year. I made a good investment in that one. Good investment. Yeah. How yeah. about that? So he, he's going to continue giving me lessons. So I, I, hopefully I can figure out driving the ball. Cause I added probably, what do you, what do you want to get to? What's your, what's your handicap goal? Uh, I want to, I want to be breaking 80, 30% of the time. Yeah. And you know what? 20% of the time next year. I wanna, I, I'd I wanna... like to just get, I'd like to just get to be a 10. I, I think if I could be a consistent 10 without like a huge uh, deviation either way that I would be happy. Yeah. I, I, I think being a 10 handicap is really probably the peak of where I'm going to be. But if I can just be around like 85, like break 90 every single time, be around like 84, right. 85. And then if I'm having an especially good round, I can shoot like 78 or something. That would be just yeah. amazing for me. I don't know if I have the skills to do that, but like this year, since the swing chain and like going through a swing change halfway through the year, like the first three rounds that I played after it were a disaster. But I can now hit the ball. Like I, I hit it a lot better cleaner and i hit it a lot farther which is really encouraging like i bought new clubs i bought a new driver like obviously that helps a little bit but just getting rid of my massive left to right slice was huge in terms of like me getting more distance but now i literally have no idea where it's going off the club so in in terms of driving the ball so i can just drive the ball a little bit straighter at least have an idea of where it's going like i probably lose on average seven balls off the tee like that's not helping your score having to re-tee no no it's sometimes twice so i'm taking five off the tee like that that's hurting my score well i mean yeah like basically the 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 simplest things you can do to make your score better are not not lose any balls over the course of a round and turn three putts into two putts like i mean those are which is you know a big driver of luck okay last thing i wanted to ask you before we got out of here uh have you seen all or most of the james bond movies i've seen every james bond movie so i'm close i i have like four more roger moore ones left yeah what is your you you could probably skip those (laughs) yeah moonraker uh i've heard is is really bad um what is your what is your favorite one? Goldfinger. And what do you what what is your favorite and what do you think is best? I think that the answer to both is Goldfinger. Goldfinger is the one that I will sit down at any time and turn on and watch. What okay, so how bad of a take is it that that I thus far my favorite one has been on Her Majesty's Secret Service? Oh, on, on Her Majesty's Secret Service is fine. Um it's yeah. all, it's all right. I wouldn't say it's like near the top, but it's potentially top 10. You're a big Lazenby guy. I just, I don't know something about the way he played it. 
Um, I thought the, um, you know, the mountain setting uh, and, and actually, you know, the fact that he was, uh, Lazenby is much more of like a Daniel Craig style, James Bond, like a, like a real person who has, has feelings and uh, gets scared and, and creates attachments and stuff. Which I don't want from Bond. I think it really depends on what you want from Bond. And I think it depends on I mean, the first, I, to, first Bond to, that you get introduced to. Like to me, Connery, sure. how Connery plays Bond is how I always is envision Bond. Bond in my mind. And I like the Daniel Craig movies, but like that's... The one, they're they're the, like not even James Bond movies. Those are like those are just like a, a, a separate thing uh, onto themselves. But like in the new Bond movie, I was pumped to go see the new Bond movie. It was the first movie I saw in theaters in like two same. years. Uh, and same, I liked same I, to both. I liked it, but there's there's a scene in that movie where could we just have the scene when they go to Cuba and they're like fighting people. Like he has the the, the female agent that he links up with, and they go to the Spectre party, and like there you know there's witty repartee they're having drinks like that's bond to me like that's fun that's why i like bond like the, the craig stuff although skyfall is awesome skyfall is one of the best bonds casino royale is great yeah they're a bit too like let's, let's pump the brakes on the serious like and that's why quantum of solace and specter were so bad like they're just yeah. way too serious it's like yeah and, and, and they're and it long and they're so long <coughs> yeah and like any any Bond movie that doesn't end with like an absolutely preposterous like uh, evil lair uh, and and you know just totally improv like it, you want the more ridiculous the ending to a Bond movie the better. I, I completely agree. And like there's certain things that Bond like without a good villain a Bond movie is going to be terrible. That was the problem with yeah. the new Bond movies. Remy Malek is fun. yeah. He was he was awful. He, he was, was awful. He was a low rent version of Javier Bardem. It was the same character. Yeah. It was the same thing. They, they even yeah, went to it, a, it they even bad. went to a secluded island again. <laughs> yeah. So my 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 other Bond uh hot take is that when I picture James Bond in my mind's eye, I picture Pierce Brosnan. Be and I think mostly it, because it, is he that was on the cover of Goldeneye, the video game. Cover of Goldeneye. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bronson's yeah. all right. Bronson actually looks the most like and maybe looks I, the most like Bond. Yeah, how yeah. I how I picture Bond in my mind as a look. It actually looked like he looks the most like how I envision James Bond. He just none of the movies were all that good with him. Like they're fine and they're fine. They're to really. I mean, die, die another day. Die another day was was F minus. Um, but uh, Golden Eye is Gold, fine. Golden Eye is Golden Eye is good. Tomorrow Never Dies is actually has gotten better over time. I think uh, if you go back and watch, which it. I which I realized last night is the the way that that ends is a big homage to um uh, uh the spy who loved me right with the the aquatic like fortress or whatever but even like the it's malcolm mcdowell's in that one right he's the villain no terrence stamp is the uh terrence stamp is the bad guy in that one i think that's the one i uh, maybe i don't i don't know their names yeah terrence stamp the old british guy he's like the Ru Ru rupert murdoch media mogul maybe yes I'm, maybe yeah, I'm, maybe i'm mixing them up now he, no, no, no. You are you are correct. That is that is correct. Yeah, I actually thought that was a good villain. Like you need to have a good villain, and just that villain type, like character, has aged well into twenty twenty one. Yes, I mean that is that is they could they could uh, they could reboot Bond. You know, whoever the next Bond is, um, they they could have you know basically him fighting against like a fake news purveyor as like like that storyline would work in 2022 yeah and i thought that was a really ahead of its time in that sense i like both dalton ones i think that they're good uh i think they're better See, i haven't than, got haven't gotten there yet both dalton ones are better than like the roger moore ones um by and large like uh, like almost to a t like all of roger them. moore roger moore is just he's hamming it up roger moore's like drunk half the time in these movies like yeah you, like, if you read the stories about like him and like him and the producer broccoli would just go get like hammered on wine uh i think it was cust who said it even on the show like a few weeks ago like there's a story about him i think it's in the spy you love me um it's one of them where there's just a scene of like bond walking down the hallway of a lair and that's all they could shoot that day because roger moore was so fucking drunk he couldn't do anything was else hammered <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and like the Connery well, ones have well the Connery ones have such like select moments in them that are memorable, they're fun, and like B Bond is a Cold War spy. So it's weird to put him in today's day and age cuz he's supposed to be like kind of what we would deem as offside now. That's kind of part of his deal cuz that's 
he's a sixties character. Like it's hard to, it's hard to update him yet stay true to the character in a weird way. Yeah. Like to have, to have like a hard drinking, uh, misogynist who, who sleeps around. Like, it's just, it's just, a, it's a very tough sell, which is why the, the Craig bond was always in love with someone or, 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 you know, sad about loving someone or whatever. Cause that was, that was a real attempt to, which I guess, I mean, to be fair, the Lazenby character was as well, you know, the way, the way that movie ends. Yeah. Connery never was having that. No, Connery. Well, Connery had the girl that he meets at the beginning of Dr. No uh, is also the girl he's, he's with when, um, you know, uh, when M calls him at the beginning of the next move of, of Goldfinger. Um, well, no, you from Russia with love. Is she's never from Russia, from, with Russia love. from Russia with love from Russia with love yeah. is excellent, by the way. That's probably like the second. Very, best very good movie. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think we talked about Bond enough. You got to get out of here, right? Yep. Uh, we, we, sometime we should do, we should do like a bond rankings pod. I think that would be good. I, I actually had that set up to do, uh, for the release of this one. And then I totally forgot about it. I also want to rank all the best bond themes. Cause I think a bond theme, it's a really distinct thing. Cause like live and let die. For example, I like the song live and let die horrible bond theme. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Like I, I, I hear, I, I hear bomb theme in my mind. I need brass instruments just straight up. Uh, I mean, did you, so did you like the, the no time to die intro? Eh, very, very wishy-washy on it. Medium, average level intro to below average. Like the casino Royale one, the Chris Cornell song, good song, terrible bond intro. Uh, the Adele song is great. That's one of the best Bond themes. I the think. Adele song was really good. What about what about Diamonds Are Forever? Diamonds Are Forever is really good. The Goldfinger, so Tina, good. That's my that's my favorite. Tina Turner's Golden Eye is really good. I think your Goldfinger is actually the best one as well. Like it's the most memorable of them. I think it's the only one that I know yeah. all the words to, probably because I've seen Goldfinger eighty times. But right, that one. Diamonds Are Forever. Thunderball is a bit weird. I think the spy who loved me has a really good one. Like the, the, even the view to a kill. Like I love the song of you to a kill. It's on my running playlist. Not a great bond theme. Fair, I mean, fair enough. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the music and stuff is very important to those movies. Yeah. Yeah. So th there's certain things that yeah. I'm looking for. Maybe I'm different than other people when it comes down to that. So anyway, rate and review yeah. my show. I'll give you a hundred bucks potentially if you win. There we go. Rate and review Pat's show. Uh, if you are listening to this on the take cast feed, Thank you. Feed. If you're listening to this on the PME feed, subscribe to the Takecast feed, and uh, we will. Uh, we'll. Uh, I'm. I'm sure we will do more of these. Uh, we. We should talk about doing the. Uh, the Bond episode. We'll. We'll figure that out. And uh, yeah, we'll. We'll see you guys soon. Do we. Do we need a third man on that? Yeah, you know who would be good. Rich. Uh, Reeb, Reeb's would be really good at. He's seen all of them, and he doesn't get to break out his pop culture chops enough. Maybe we can get Cust in on that too, because Cust is a big Bond guy. Four man pop. I don't know what I don't know what would happen with with me and Cust on the same show. It would Why? really be something. Why? Cust is literally the most likable person on the planet. No, no, I know. I just think like two two mushes of our degree on the same show. Like who knows what could happen? I suppose that's true. Yeah, we have to come up with some uh, holiday content. Although football goes throughout the holidays now, which tough scene for content creators yeah oh tough tough scene tough scene to have uh football games on on christmas day it, it was, it's not so much christmas day that i mind it's that like at least before it was week 17 so no one cared but now week 17 is a week you care about it's right like, oh man now i have to do like real content for this it sucks <laughs> yeah yeah real content who needs that yeah all right man take it easy bud yeah experience Experience!